Random Inx Productions and the Credible Nerds present The Fourth Taviran, a Wheel of Time podcast. The Wheel of Time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Let the dragon ride again on the winds of time. Welcome, everyone, to the Credible Nerds podcast. This is episode one of our Wheel of Time podcast called The Fourth Taviran. My name is Justin, and as always, I have my co-host with me, Mark. Hey, guys. How's it going? And this is episode one of the Wheel of Time podcast series that we'll be doing. Uh, We'll be doing a few chapters here at a time and then slowly covering all the books all the way up to the, the last book. This series was written by Robert Jordan. It, the first book was published in January of 1990, and he actually started writing it in 1984. And it took him six years to write the first book, or at least establish the world that he was going to be writing about, and eventually got to the point where he published that first book in January of 1990. Uh, the Eye of the World is the first book, and there are 14 books total with a prequel, and there are two companion books. The White Book, as it's commonly known, and then there's the the black book, which is more of an encyclopedia that was published at the end of all, after all the books were published and the series was completed. The white book was written probably halfway through the series. And it contains a lot of background uh, information on world and characters and societies and all that kind of stuff. I always got the impression that it was kind of his his notes that he was able to compile and put into a a book form and so we'll be relying heavily on those as well as much as the the actual the books in the series Um, so for for us mark we've been reading this series for quite some time Um, i think i started reading it in like 1995 i want to say yeah well a friend at work got me into it i worked at a bookstore and she kept bugging me to read The Wheel of Time. And then when book seven came out, I finally agreed and started reading from the beginning and I've loved it ever since. And then we met probably in 19, I think it was 1999 that we were first introduced to each other. And I, I can't remember if, if you were already reading it or if I introduced you or if someone else introduced you and we kind of like, hey, you read the book, these books too? Or I don't remember, but... Uh, you know, we shortly found out that we like these books and have been talking about them ever since. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I've been thinking about this. Um, we've talked about this a few times. I know for a fact that I started reading it before Winter's Heart. Okay. And that came out That came out in 2003. But I don't think I started reading it before Path of Daggers. And that came out in 98. So, but I think it was right in there um, because I remember the long wait. Like I remember waiting a long time for Winter's Heart to come out. Yeah. So I I probably started right in 99 somewhere. And like I said, I'm not sure if I had started it um, because you had suggested it or or what. But at some point we started reading it together right about uh, Winter's Heart. And... Um, you know, we read it uh, through there, right? Yeah. Uh, I think we went to the book signings of Knife of Dreams. No, that was the last Robert Jordan fully written book. It was after that. Oh, well, Gathering Storm. Yeah, then. Gathering Storm. Okay, so we went to Gathering. We so we went to the signings of Gathering Storm together. Um, but I know we were reading them together. So I want to say, you know, probably 1999, 2000 is when I really got into it. And since then, I've probably read the series four, four or five times. Yeah. Right. Uh, I skip Winter's Heart every time because <laughs> I cannot handle it. Uh, if you've read the series, you'll agree with me. If you say you don't agree with me, you've never read the series. <laughs> so <laughs> it's that bad. No, it's not bad. It's just a lot of book for nothing, like a lot of nothing. 
Yeah. So yeah, we'll get into that in a few months when we get there. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And we'll go through that book really fast. So, (laughs) um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a great series. It, I, it's a great pastime. I think the only thing greater than reading it is finding out that they're going to making a series of it. And I, I hope they do amazing. Yeah. The, the showrunner who's basically writing the scripts or in charge of getting the scripts written, uh, Rafe Judkins, he's on Twitter and every Wednesday he does a wheel of time Wednesday post. So if you're all, if you're on Twitter, check him out and, or search for hashtag W O T Wednesday. Uh, the, the wheel of time fan base has been reinvigorated and everybody's excited about this new series that they recently announced that Amazon studios will be producing and putting on their, their uh, app that you can download and, and watch shows there. So we're all excited about that. Uh, once I, myself included, when, I mean, once I heard about that, I started reading the series again and I'm uh, probably I'm on book six right now. So, it's a good series. It's been a couple of years since I read it last, but it's just as entertaining because there's so much to it. There's so much depth, uh, so much, so many characters that interact, you know, hundreds of characters in this story. So there's just so much information that you, when you read it over again, you're like, Oh yeah, I forgot about that. And it's, it's almost like it's brand new again. So definitely check it out. If you haven't, hopefully you have, uh, and you're, listening to this podcast to kind of catch up or follow us on the journey on our reread and just join us in the conversation as well. So uh, we'll get started with the prologue for the eye of the world, which is book one. There's a prequel, like I mentioned earlier called a new spring and we'll probably get into that one around book five or six. Cause I think that's when it was, uh, released published and released was about halfway through the series so we'll get into that at some point but we're going to start off with eye of the world and there's a prologue called dragon mount and for for each chapter in these books there's always a chapter icon which kind of gives you a little hint as to what the chapter is about who it's about Um, and this point of view that this prologue has is from luz theron and he is the dragon And this prologue actually takes place hundreds of years before this main story that we're going to get into starting in chapter one. And it kind of gives us a little snippet of who the dragon is, how it's, how he kind of met his demise and what happened in his final minutes. And we're introduced to another character, Elon Morin Tedroni, who's also known as Ishmael. How do you say it? I say Ishmael. Listen, people, there are so many different pronunci- pronunciations to these names. Everyone has their own. And then if you listen to the stupid, well, not stupid, but if you listen to the audiobooks, even the, the speakers uh, pronounce them different uh, than in the encyclopedias at the end of the books. So we're going to say names. If you call it something else, I'll power to you. We're, uh, we're just going to call them what we call them. So I say Ishmael. Yeah, and he is one of Luce Theron's mortal enemies. He's also one of the Forsaken that we learn later on in this book. And there's talk, we don't actually meet her, but there's talk of Luce Theron's wife, Ilyena. And she is dead at this point, at the start of the chapter, or this prologue. So um, the, the chapter starts out with, is kind of this destructive force has happened. There's dead bodies everywhere. It's covered at the palace, this building that he's in, there's scorch marks on the walls and the floors and there's fires, you know, so you get the sense that there's been some destruction recently and Luz Theron is looking for his wife, Ilyana, and is calling out her name, wondering where she is. He seems kind of lost, disoriented and not completely there. And as the story goes on, you kind of figure out why, but he ends up, meeting this black clad man who ends up being Ishmael. So they, they talk for a minute and we, we learn that they are enemies that they've fought many battles and been at war with one, one another for a while. 
Yeah, so this part's kind of weird, right? Uh, if you read the book, it seems kind of out of place because you don't really know what's going on. You, it just kind of hops right in. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really give you any context other than there's, like Justin said, there's some kind of con- destruction going on. Um, uh, Ishmael's talking to to Luz Theron, and he kind of gives him his memory back. You don't really know how he just uses a power to do so. And he gives Luz Theron his memory back and he remembers what's going on. And we find out that what's going on is Luz Theron has actually been the one to cause the destruction. And he has killed everybody he loves, including Ilyana, who is wife. And it kind of started driving him insane even more, right? He, He's really sad. He starts crying. He starts screaming. I mean, it's even worse. And uh, uh, Ellen, who he call, you know, he calls him by his name, Ellen. You know, he's enjoying it. You know, he likes to see him, but at the same time, you can tell he's upset because uh, of the state that Luz Theron's in. Yeah, at one point they were friends. they they were close, but because of the events that we'll we'll learn about later, they became enemies. And the, this power that they use, we'll talk a little bit about that. It stems from, you know, the true power, the one power, and there's two sides to this power. There's the, the male half, Sidene, and the female half, Sidar. And there's only certain people that can use this power. And the males, they're all called Aes Sedai. It's their, their group, the, per, the people that are able to use this power, called Aes Sedai. And there's males and females, and the males, something happened that we'll get into later that uh, when they use sighting, it drives them mad, it makes them crazy because of what happened. And what's the dark one, who's also, you know, the, the enemy, there's the creator and the dark one, and the dark one has tainted sighting. So any male who uses sighting eventually goes crazy. So th- we learned this, this is what's happening to Luz Theron. And mm-hmm. what he ends up doing is he, because he's going crazy and he's so distraught and devastated by what he, he himself did, that once he realizes this, he destroys himself. He calls down lightning and fire from heaven, from the heavens above, and to strike him to so he can destroy himself because he, he just wants to bury himself. He wants to cease to exist. So he draws as much power as, as much of this power as he can to try and kill himself. So he will cease to exist. And in doing so it, it works. He, he dies. But it, in essence, it creates this huge mountain in its, in its place. And the, that mountain is called dragon mount. Cause that uh, loose Theron was called the nickname, the dragon. And so they named that mountain, um, dragon mount which ends up playing a part later on in this story. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, he's also known that you'll, you'll hear the name throughout uh, as we talk. He'll also be known as Kinslayer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's known as that because he killed his own family. Uh, now, n- not a lot is known about uh, the taint other than it drives the men mad. And we don't really know how. Obviously, at some point, they forget what's going on and they start killing people. Uh, but it doesn't really, it seems like it affects everybody a little different from reading the books. And, and we'll talk more about that as, as those occur, but we don't get to see it as prevalent as, as this um, epilogue, right? Uh, this is really the only time you actually see somebody just lose control. Yeah. Yeah. This is probably the most severe or extreme account of a man going mad from, from wielding sighting is here in this. We see a little bit of it later on, but this is probably the the most extreme example. So, yeah, that happens, and we transition into chapter one. And chapter one is called An Empty Road, and the chapter icon in this chapter is the Wheel and Serpent, which represents the Wheel of Time. And the point of view we get in this chapter is from Rand, who is our main character. And we start off on this road. They call it the Quarry Road. And Rand and his father, Tam, are headed to the the nearest town that they 
live by and that they have all their friends live there called Emmons Field, which is in the two rivers. And do you want to talk a little bit about the Wheel of Time and and what that is actually, Mark? Yeah, so uh, the Wheel of Time is just what it sounds like. Uh, and this is not going to sound exciting, but it's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we think of time as a linear um, motion, right? Uh, as time comes and goes, we'll never see it again. We can't relive time. We can't do anything. Um, but the will of time is exactly what it sounds. Time is circular, right? And Robert Jordan talked a little bit about this. If you listen to the, his um, uh, audio books, at the end of the first one, he gives a little talk about it. And it's pretty interesting, uh, you know, as you get into these books to hear him talk about it because uh, they see time as so di- different from us. What happens will happen again. So they have seven ages one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this book currently takes place in the third ages, third age. Uh, they will talk about what's called the age of legends. And that is the second age. So really this book is kind of covering two ages, um, but it takes place in the third age. Uh, and then, so as time moves on to the fourth age, fifth age, sixth, seventh, it'll go back to one, two, and three. And it was pretty interesting to hear him talk about it. Cause it's like, um, a lot of the people uh, like Rand and, you know, some of the people we'll talk about, Matt Cawthoon, Perrin Ibarra, they talk about some of the heroes, Luz Theron Telemon being one of them. They talk about the 100 Companions. We'll get into that more later. They talk about these groups and these people that they're heroes. But in the Fourth Age, they talk about Rand and them as heroes, and that time will keep coming and going, right? So... Uh, the way in the book kind of explains it, it's like, you know, in an age long past and an age yet to come because it, it will continue happening over and over again. So it's pretty interesting how it goes. Now, I don't know if that means that Rand Thor will always be in the third age, but the events of the third age will continue happening until I guess the dark one wins. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, but uh, apparently, however many times it's turned, the dark one has not won yet, and that is good news. <laughs> yep, good news for us. <laughs> and we were talking before the show, and you had mentioned that we are currently in the seventh age. That's like if we were to uh, pertain this to real life, Robert Jordan said, oh, we're in the seventh age. Is that so I don't know if it was Robert Jordan. I was just reading on some uh, Wikipedia, as you know, just uh, different uh, – things and so not a lot of is known about the other ages we get a little snippets about what happened in the fourth age uh, but really that comes down to like three lines uh the first age we don't really know about it. it's been generally um agreed upon and i don't know if this is from robert jordan or not i i'd probably need to do more studying into it but you we hear about portal stones we'll talk actually about them in book two uh, a little bit more in depth but these portal stones were said to be created in the first age um, and kind of through goes through. And while I was reading this Wikipedia, it talked about the seventh age is our age right now. And that eventually it will end with nuclear destruction. And then that will hail the first age. Okay. All right. So a little speculation there. So chapter one, uh, these first four, Two, three, four chapters are pretty simple. They introduce characters. They introduce ideas. Uh, Not not a lot happens, but it's, you know, it's setting the tone, setting the the table for the rest of this book as well as the rest of the series. So we'll just be covering mostly characters and some minor situations. Um, But uh, so this first chapter, like we said, Rand and his father, Tam, are walking down the quarry road. And Rand thinks he sees this shadowy figure, this guy in this dark cloak on a black horse. And so he looks, he sees it. He's like, well, he looks back and it's gone. So he tells his dad, Hey, I I think I saw something and tells his dad, his dad believes him, even though he doesn't see it. And he kind of gets a little, um, they get a little cautious about things. So they finally make it to the town of Emmons field. And there's, the celebration coming up is kind of their New Year's called Beltine, our winter's night. And 
everybody's in preparation for that. You know, we meet some some characters such as Matt Cawthon. He's one of Rand's, one of Rand's best friends, him and uh, Perrin Ibarra. We meet in the next chapter, but so him and Matt talk, they kind of joke around. Matt's the troublemaker of the series. He's the trickster and he's always making jokes. Everybody thinks he's a pest, kind of that annoying little brother type, at least in the beginning of this series. He's always stealing pies or, pulling tricks on pranks on people and just kind of an annoyance to everybody, but everybody loves him because he's, he's so lovable and nice and funny, but he, him and Rand are good buddies. And so they start talking and they, he finds out that Matt has seen this shadowy figure too. So that's like, Oh, that's weird. So they, they tell, um, they talk about that with each other. And they also find out that a Gleeman has arrived in the village to celebrate Beltine. And the Gleeman has never or rarely come to to Emmons Field. So that's like this huge deal. You know, a Gleeman is kind of a bard, but they travel around and visit people. But they, you know, they tell stories, play songs, juggle, that sort of thing. So Mm -hmm. we get to, to find out more about this Gleeman it's a big deal. So that's kind of the first chapter. We're introduced to some of our our main characters, two of them, with Randolph Thor and Matt Cawthon. And we kind of get this this feel or this vibe of Emmons Field, what it's all about. It's kind of this quaint little village in the on the edge of nowhere where nothing ever happens. They live their life the same way they've lived it for the past, you know, hundred years or more. They have their traditions. They have their their way of doing things. It's just this nice little place to grow up. So yeah, so that's chapter one. Uh, not a whole lot happens, uh, as you can see. It's just kind of introduction. We're introducing Rand and his father, mostly, right? Uh, so we enter chapter two. Uh, chapter two uh, is called Strangers. So, uh, so chapter one ends, and we we move into chapter two. Uh, so we've met Rand, we've met Matt. Uh, at this point, we we get to introduce to some more people, some minor characters, and a couple other main characters. Uh, the minor characters we're introduced to is Mistress Alvir. She is uh, the wife of the mayor. And then we meet Bran. Bran is the the husband, so he's the mayor, and he's a generally big guy. A lot of people like him. He's well known. He is also the only owner of an inn in the entire Two Rivers, uh, so he has the largest house. Um, and we get uh, introduced to you know a couple more people that kind of fly under the radar. It doesn't really matter. But the biggest introductions here are more Moraine and Lan. Now, while the boys are talking, uh, a uh, young man comes running up. I think it was Ewen fin- Fingar. Is that his name? Yeah. Ewen Fingar. And he starts talking. He's like, hey, there's these two visitors, and they're amazing. It's this lady. Her name's – and uh, I think he tells her their name, right? His name's Maureen, and the big guy, it's like a soldier. His name's Lan. And, uh, you know, he's looking for young men or, you know, kind of something or the other. And uh, so they meet him. And it, this is kind of huge because we're talking Maureen is a rich, very well-dressed, very articulate, educated person. And Lan is this big, you know, they think he's just a bodyguard. But, but the interesting thing is, is that nobody likes this, like this comes to the village. Uh, they've never met people like this. So it's a, it's a real big uh, commotion of these people. And uh, they talk to Maureen and Maureen, you know, just says, hey, you know, if, uh, eh, you know, if, if you guys can help me, will you help me? And he, she gives him a coin and gives all the boys a coin. And the coin becomes very important later. Um, we later find out that the coin helps track the boys. Uh, but, um, you know, so it introduces Maureen and Lan and Maureen and Lan are very big characters throughout the book. And they will, they'll be mentioned nonstop. So it's very important to remember their names. Uh, like I said, I call her Moiraine. <laughs> Is that how you say it, Justin? Yeah. Moiraine or Moiraine. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, so that's the biggest thing here. It's just uh, like we said, I know, I know this is, you might get a little bored, but this is introduction to characters. Very important. Um, we get a little, hear a little bit more about Rand and Matt and their, uh, the person they saw. Uh, they kind of come to find out that a lot of the boys their age have seen this cloaked figure throughout the towns, you know, from the distance, wherever. And it's really starting to worry them. And they start talking, you know, more seriously about, we need to talk to my dad. You know, Rand is saying this, who is Tam Althor. He's on the village council. They need to talk to the mayor, Bran. Uh, and they just don't really know how to approach it because it's, you know, imagine if you went to your dad and said, Hey dad, I saw a cloaked figure and I turned around and he was gone. Like I can imagine saying that to my dad and I'd be having a sore butt for a while. So, you know, uh, it just kind of goes on, like I said, introduction. And, and so we move into chapter three and things kind of start picking up, right? Justin's going to tell us all about the cool peddler. So yeah, so with the peddler, um, this chapter icon is the dragon's fang, which we learn is a symbol of evil, and it's um, it's there's an Isidai symbol. It's the yin and yang symbol, basically, with one half dark, one half white, and the dark half kind of looks like a a tooth, an ups- like a, a dragon's fang. And so they draw this dragon's fang on people's door who they think is a dark friend who's part of the, you know, the dark Lords group. Um, And we get Rand's point of view on all this once again. And so they find out that there's a peddler in town as well. And peddler, you know, is kind of like what it sounds. They bring, supplies foods you know like treats and toys for the for the kids that the the villagers can buy you know there's so this is their way to transport goods and and things like that so the peddler comes to town they got a gleeman they got a uh, a lady and a bodyguard and it's just all this stuff that never happens in emmonsfield is happening so everyone's excited there's a lot of bustle hustle and bustle and everyone's looking forward to the celebration of Beltine. We get to meet Perrin Ibira for the first time in this chapter. Um, so there's Perrin, Matt, and Rand. And they're the three friends. And they kind of talk about things as well. And they they realize that, um, that Perrin has, has seen the the shadowy figure as well and also we find out that Perrin got a coin from Moraine as well so you know all four there's the four boys Rand Matt Perrin and Edwin is Edwin yeah Edwin got a coin so they're kind of wondering what that's all about uh we also meet Egwin and Egwin at this time is basically Rand's girlfriend they're promised or you know, scheduled to be to be married at some point down the road. Um, they like each other, but I don't. I never get the sense that they love each other. They're just kind of that's how, you know, their their parents basically set them up to be married, and so they've accepted it. And but they still like each other. They're still good friends. <laughs> yeah, and look, it if you are for some crazy reason reading this book for relationship advice. You will find none from Perrin, Matt, or Rand. I mean, I'm telling you what, throughout the whole book, all you hear about is like Matt will say, man, if only Rand was here, he knows about girls. And then you hear, like you're reading about Rand, he's like, oh man, if only Perrin was here, Perrin knows about girls and vice versa. Like none of them know a dang thing, I'll tell you what, and they're all idiots when it comes to girls. So, uh, But for some reason, all the girls are like attracted to these three boys. Like it's so funny. Uh, and yeah. I, I remember reading this book and the first time like Rand's talking to Egwin and he starts blushing and doesn't know what to say. He literally thinks that like, oh, Matt would know what to say to her. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. it's kind of funny. It, yeah. You'll notice it when you read it. It's funny and it never stops. And it, it is just as funny every time. Yeah. So they, they also talk about uh, the, the village wisdom in these first couple of chapters. 
but I don't think, yeah, we don't meet her just yet. And the village wisdom is Nynaeve Almira. And she's kind of the, the last one of this group, these Marian characters. There's five main characters from this village, Matt, Perrin, Rand, Egwene, and then Nynaeve. And they kind of become the core group that we read about through the rest of this series. Nynaeve is a little older. These, these four, Matt, Perrin, Rand, and Egwene are pretty much the same age, late teens, you know, 17, 18, maybe 19. But Nynaeve, I always got the impression she was around 22, 24, 25 maybe. She's just a little bit older, but still young enough that they can relate and they know each other and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about uh, uh, the power later, but um, Nine Eve and Egwin are both, you know, they can both use this power we talked about earlier. And uh, so it, it's good to know that now um, because it comes in play later. Uh, you won't read about it. So it kind of sneaks up on you. Uh, but uh, like Justin said, they're really big characters. It's great to get to know them. It's tough to read them. When I first read the books, you may not like, I hated Nine Eve. I hated Egwene. And then at the end, I loved them. So stick with these characters. I know a lot of this is mundane because we're talking about a 14 book series. So a lot of these first chapters are going to be pretty boring, but read them. They're great. Push through. Yeah. Not a lot, not a lot happens for the first three or four chapters, but it's great character developments. You know, we get to see their relationships, how they interact, a little bit of history with them, that sort of thing. So they're, they're interesting in a different way. Just not a lot happens, but uh, we actually do get to meet Nynaeve in this chapter and Nynaeve and Egwene kind of gang up on the boys like they're want to do in this, in this series. So, um, so after chapter three, the peddler, we move into chapter four, the Gleeman. <laughs> so these chapter names aren't that exciting, right? Uh, strangers, the peddler, the Gleeman. You know, it's a lot of just bland, not bland, but a lot of just uh, introduction chapters, basically. So this chapter is, the, the icon is a harp which is always associated with the Gleeman, whose name is Tom Marilyn. So every time there's a chapter with Tom in it, uh, that's featured heavily, you'll see the, the harp icon. And so we're introduced to the Gleeman. You want to talk a little bit about Tom? Yeah. Uh, so Tom ends up being one of my favorite characters. He kind of goes MIA for like a book and a half. Right. Yeah. But uh, um, but for the for this book, he's in in for quite a bit of it. Um, so Tom is a, a gleeman and a gleeman is pretty much the same thing as a bard. If you know what a bard is, I'll explain. If you don't, I'm going to explain it to you right now. A bard is pretty much plays at court. Um, they're very uh, skilled in telling stories. They can, you know, play music, they juggle, they dance, they, they do it all right. And they're amazing at it. And people pay lots of money to have them. And so when they're at court, they call him a bard. Uh, he's a gleeman. He travels around and does the same thing. And so we get to meet this gleeman. And so if I remember right, he was invited by the village council to come to celebrate bell time. We kind of start finding out Moraine and Lan are there for a reason, and you kind of, you kind of see that in the reading, like they have an ulterior motive. They're there for something, uh, but uh, but Tom he just happens to be there because they called on him and he, and he's there, and so everyone's excited. Like Gleeman just never comes to to the Two Rivers, and uh, he's an older gentleman. When I think of uh, Tom Marilyn. Uh, you know, I just think of like one of those happy old guys that are just happy go lucky and, you know, has fun and just enjoys life. Right. Um, so, yeah. So he, he kind of just interacts with the, the characters, Matt's Perrin, Rand, Egwin even, and you just kind of get this, they bounce off each other and get to know each other. You kind of, they take to him like he's a, an older fun uncle type, right? He, mm-hmm. 
does all these cool things and they're super impressed with his juggling skills and all that stuff. So we get to know Tom a little bit and but then Rand and his father Tam decide to go back home for that. I think they would normally stay the night, but they decided to go back home uh, for that night. So Rand says goodbye to his friends. They and him and Tam take off and go home. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and you find out that the reason they're leaving home is because now everybody's starting to believe the young men. Like it's not just Matt who's super mischievous saying this story right everybody like they're starting to hear it from all these young men like man there's this uh, stranger about and it's really scaring people uh master luhan really big blacksmith he's carrying around like a big heavy hammer with him you know like it's really got people on edge yeah so they decided to head back home and because they they got a farm with sheep to feed and you know things like that so they want to go back home and keep an eye on things. So then that leads us into chapter five called Winter Nights. And that is a celebration of New Year's basically. But instead of a celebration, a lot of crazy stuff happens. This is when stuff starts to happen. Story starts to pick up and it gets exciting. And all, you know, the past three or four chapters that, you know, you've been reading, we start to get the payoff. It starts to get interesting at this point. So the chapter icon is a tree and it starts off in uh, back at uh, Tam Althor's house. And just for some background info, Tam was once married to Carrie Althor and they had Rand. Rand was their only child. But Carrie died uh, probably a few years ago from the start of the story. So Rand remembers her, but he was still kind of young when she died. But and so for the last few years, it's been just him and his father out on this farm. So they make it back home and Tam pulls out a sword from his chest underneath his bed. And Rand's like, Whoa, what sword? My dad's got a sword. So He's kind of in awe about that. And Tam's like, oh, this is just in case, you know, I'm a little worried about things. So I just want to get it out now and make sure, you know, nothing happens. Kind of plays it off nonchalant. So they're getting ready to eat, eat some food. And all of a sudden, these Trollocs burst through the door, start trying to attack them and kill them. And Trollocs are kind of the the soldiers of the, the, the Dark One in this story, you know, they're kind of like orcs from Lord of the Rings or, you know, just that, those dispensable foot soldiers that all the bad guys seem to have. They can just throw thousands of them at the good guys and doesn't matter if they die or not. Mm -hmm. But it's good to know that these are not like Lord of the Rings orcs as the point, how they fight, because apparently one soldier can kill 50,000 orcs, but, uh, uh, Trollocs are huge, right? I mean, they are a force to be dealt with. Uh, most most soldiers do not think that they can fight a Trolloc one-on-one because they're so big and strong. So, I mean, take that for what it's worth. So when we say, like, these are Trollocs and there's 10 of them, that, that means something. That's not like, oh, great. I guess someone with one sword is going to kill them all with one swing. Yeah, they're they're serious business. They're a cross between humans and animals, right? And they've been around for thousands of years. Back in you know this, the earlier ages, there were Trollocs. They were created from from beasts, different beasts, cows, oxen, goat, and mixed with humans. So they're they're kind of smart, but not really, and they don't really talk. I think in this, I don't know if it's this chapter or the next one, but it's like the only time we ever hear a Trolloc speak. (laughs) And then after that, I don't know if the author was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that anymore. But they don't ever (laughs) talk after that, after this first time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We never, 
I mean, I guess like it talks about them speaking in their guttural language, right? Or whatever right. it is. Yeah. And some people understand that. So they're like, oh, this is what they said. But like, <laughs> it's kind of an anomaly. Uh, I don't know why it happened. And it's never explained why it's happened. So, but apparently this one Trolloc happened to study uh, English and happened to say something. Yeah. And his name is Narg. N-A-R-G. And I think it's the only Trolloc that's ever named too. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so they fight. Tam has his sword and he's fighting off the Trollocs and yells for Ren to escape. So Ren is able to jump out or escape through the, the door, the back door. And Tam jumps through the window and kind of leads the Trollocs away. Um, Ren sneaks back in finds that uh, Tam's injured. And then this is when we see Narg come in and um, Ran kind of grabs his dad's sword and accidentally kills him. You know, he falls on him the wrong way. And so um, he gets his first kill. But uh, all the Trollocs are dead. So Ran grabs his dad and the the horse Bella, uh, which Bella goes on to continue on with these heroes all the way through to the last book. So it's kind of interesting. I always thought it was kind of cute that Bella is always there in the midst of all the action too, from the beginning to the end. But uh, so Ran takes Tam, puts him on this cart and Bella pulls the, the cart all the way back to Emmons field. So he can get some, you know, get fixed up. He wants to take him back to the village wisdom naive to be able to get healed. And so that's the end of chapter five. Mm -hmm. And chapter five really is intense. It's like the start of the story, right? Introductions are over. It it really is a star story. So it really kind of jump starts everything for me. I really enjoyed, I remember reading this chapter. I was like, this is great. Yeah. Like, especially as he's like walking at night, you know, he's walking through this forest trying to get home and, you know, he hears people coming down the road. So he has to hurry off and hide. And you can just imagine, you know, hauling your father just dying. Like he's, he talks about, he's out of breath. His chest is burning and he's not going to make it. And he's just counting his steps basically. And then he makes it and you're just with him the whole time. You're like, he did it, Rand did it. Oh my goodness. And then no one can heal him. And you're like, Oh my, Oh my goodness. You know, Rand's not, his dad's going to die anyway. And then you find out Moraine is an Aes Sedai and you're like, Oh my gosh, it's, this is amazing. Right. It, it's just, uh, it, it's really the big start to the whole storyline. It really jump starts it all in a great way. Um, this is in, probably in this book, this is probably one of my favorite sequences of events uh, because it's really well written. Uh, it brings a lot of context to this, the story because the first four chapters are really, it's almost like it's vague just because you know, something's going on, but you don't, but it's focusing on characters. And then all of a sudden we see this. So it, it's really fun to read about uh, and we'll talk more about next time about what happens, like what's going to go on now. But, you know, if you're reading with us or if you haven't picked up a book, pick up the book and go through it with us. We'd love you, for you to do that. Uh, the first five chapters are great. Uh, I think they take maybe an hour to read. You know, they're pretty quick uh, chapters. So pick up the book, read it with us and, and, and enjoy it. And if you have things to add, uh, great. Uh, we'd love to hear them. Yeah, definitely pick it up. Like Mark said, join us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, under Credible Nerds. Um, you can email us questions or thoughts or, you know, correct us if we got something wrong. Uh, CredibleNerds at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to have you part of this conversation and this reread as well. Also join us on our Patreon page. Uh, support us there. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, but definitely check us out on iTunes, Stitcher, our favorite podcast app. You know, give us a listen. Let us know what you think. But uh, it's been fun. Looking forward to this reread and this long, extensive review of The Wheel of Time, one of our favorite series. Um, right now we're doing five chapters at a time, but as time goes on, we might 
lengthen that or shorten that just to kind of depends on what the chapters are about. I think some of them we could probably skim through pretty quickly and some we'll tend to focus a little more on, but that's kind of what we'll be doing for the next, like I said, few months, if not a year, because this series is pretty lengthy, but very fun to read. And it's been one of my favorite series. Uh, yes. I've ever read. It, it, yeah, it is really is a great series. And I'm going to be doing some stuff on the side. Keep an eye open for it. Uh, as we, we get talking more about this stuff, we're going to start talking about things like the one power, the forsaken, the and, and these don't mean anything to you now, but they will. And the book doesn't really talk in depth about of it, but like Justin said, we have these other books called the White Book and stuff that really gives a lot of context. And we'll be putting stuff out on the side that will help you get context if you want. We'll go in more into depth what the Forsaken are, where they come from, because uh, it talks about it in the book, but it talks about it over like 10 books. So you never really get everything up front. And, uh, you know, so as we get delve further into this, I'm going to go further and, and you're welcome to look at that stuff if you want to know. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot to, to cover in this series and Mark's little information that he's able to come up with on the side will, will go a long way in helping to understand more about the story and the overall story arc of these characters and, and this world. So. We want to thank you guys for joining us here on the fourth Taviran podcast about the wheel of time. And we'll catch you next time. See you guys.